Again, we want to thank those of you that have served our country in the preservation of freedom. It is because of your sacrifice that we are able to worship openly. So thank you. I really like going to conferences. They are on kind of the highlight for pastors to be able to go to conferences, hear somebody else do some preaching and on get some on new information and sometimes enter into some debates, get to rub shoulders with your fellow pastors. On There are really uh, there are a bunch of different types of conferences, but the kind that I go to, there's really three different types of conferences. Some of them are just fun, uplifting conferences. They might be promise keepers or women of faith. Uh, honestly, I've never been to a woman of faith conference, but I understand it's something like promise keepers. Um, Promise Keepers, by the way, has a conference in uh, Loveland coming up this summer, about the 24th, 25th of uh, July, and there's a Women of Faith conference, I think, in October. Um, Those are are good conferences. They they really build you up, and they they get a lot of people together and and singing these great great, uh, songs and hearing these great preaching. They really build your faith. I I like that kind of conference. Uh, Another kind of conference is um, a a, a, a to-do conference. Uh, you go to a conference in order to learn something, and a conference I've been to and, and really received a lot of from was a Sticky Church Conference. Uh, it's kind of it's a conference that the guy uh, at North uh, Coast Church in, in Vista, California, has written this book called Sticky Church, and uh, he throws a conference uh, every year where pastors come together and around a theme of how to become a sticky church. On uh, uh, another, another kind of conference, and the, the Evangelical Preachers holds, holds this every January, January. It's the EFCA Theology, Theology Conference. conference. Uh, that's when uh, pastors and uh, uh, denominational uh, leaders get together and debate theological points. On uh, each of these types of conferences, they, they have a common theme, and that is that uh, there's an issue uh, for for promise keepers. The issue is that uh, men, the longer they're in a church, the more it becomes old, old hat, and they kind of lose interest and and uh, it, 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 the uh, promise keepers are intent on uh, booing up the faith of men, and uh, they they have options, and the, the options are to just let men drift out of the church, or you connect with one another, and then they, they end up with this resolution of the, the seven promises of a promise keeper. Um, the, uh, the Sticky Church Conference has the, the issue is that in a lot of churches we can attract people, but uh, people don't stick around over the long haul, and the Sticky Church says, well, we have a couple options. We can just accept that that's normal, or we can... Uh, take it head on, and they, have, they offer a resolution that you have sermon-based care groups, which connects people together and causes them to stay in the church, causes them to want to be in church on Sunday because they don't want to miss the sermon uh, for the next small group. Uh, the theology conferences, to me, are, are actually the most exciting because they are, they are around uh, an issue, a theological issue, and almost always there are different sides to the issues, and, and they, they hope to come to some kind of a, of a mutually understood resolution. So the Evangelical Free Church has had um, conferences where we dealt with a clarification of our doctrinal statement. Uh, uh, we had one whole conference where, where we discussed the meaning of one word. You know, you know you've got a bunch of theologians together when they can spend three or four days discussing the meaning of one word. Uh, what does the word imminent mean? And, and so they discuss that and, and bandy about, about back and forth. They, they meet for things like, uh, what are we going to do with the ordination of women? Or uh, we had another big, long debate that extended well beyond the conference over the nature of the resurrected body of Christ. Now, you can tell that this is, this is pastor stuff. This is theologian type of stuff, uh, stuff that you might not think of on a regular basis. One of the recent ones was on the, the, uh, the biblical understanding of human sexuality. Uh, we, we have conferences on the nature of the Trinity, the defining of the canon, uh, our understanding of election and predestination, or even uh, how does inerrancy apply to us today. Uh, there's a long history of theological conferences, and uh, the first one is actually recorded in Scripture. It is a long history. It's recorded in Acts chapter 15, which is our text for today. It is the first church conference. And let's read that text together. Um, actually, I'll read you follow along, I, just in case some of you think I wanted you to read out loud. Um, if you want to, you're welcome to, but um, so just be clear that I'm planning on reading you're going to follow. <laughs> Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of, uh, taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas into sharp dispute and debate with them. 
So Paul and Barnabas were appointed along with some other believers to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. There's the first conference. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. He did this, uh, he did not discriminate between us and them for he, put, uh, he purified their hearts by faith. Now then, why do you try to test God by putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear? No, we believe it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling them about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophet are in agreement with this. As it is written, After this I will return and rebuild David's fallen tent, and its ruins I will rebuild and I will restore it, that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who bear my name, says the Lord, who does these things, things known from long ago. It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogues on every Sabbath. This is the word of the Lord. They have a church conference to get together to talk about an issue. And the issue that comes up to them is the issue of what must you do to be saved. The, the gospel has started out in, it, within the confines of Judaism. It has started off in Jerusalem, in the synagogues, in the temple, and now it is spreading throughout the whole region. And as it is spreading, when Paul and Barnabas, when the missionaries go out, the first place they go is they go to the synagogues where they read the scripture and they begin to explain from the Old Testament scriptures all about Jesus. And so the early church starts out in the synagogues and it expands out beyond the synagogue as, on, a little dog up here. It's cute. Can I have that dog? Pick the dog up and show everybody your little dog. It caught my attention. I, there's something shiny. I'm like one of those dogs on that. On, on that. Ooh, a squirrel. Um, I can't figure out where I was. Um, so they got this issue. The, 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 the church has expanded beyond just the walls of the synagogues, and the Gentiles are beginning to come, and we've seen from Acts chapter 10 that God has, has opened the gospel to the world, and he's tell, he, he, the gospel has always been open to the whole world. We're just starting to understand it in Acts chapter 10, and, and as Paul and Barnabas are on their missionary journey, it's expanding. And they, they suddenly have this issue because it comes out of Judaism. The issue is, what do you have to do to be saved? And it is an issue which is central for the future of the church. It's central for our understanding of how God acts even today. To insist on circumcision would have demanded that a person become Jewish before they are accepted as Christian. And if we had demanded that they follow the law, then Christianity would have always been a subset, a sect of Judaism. But even more important is the central issue of the Christian church. What is our salvation made of? How are we saved? Are we saved on the basis of Christ alone? Or are we saved on the basis of Christ plus? Is Christ's death on the cross sufficient? 
Or are there a set of rules which we must follow, essentially before and after we come to Christ, in order to genuinely be saved? That's the issue. So they gather together, the leaders of the church gather together in Jerusalem for the first uh, Christian council. And they offer these options. And there were significant options. The first option is, is that which is represented by Barnabas and Paul, and represented by Peter. It is the option that says we are saved by grace. The option that the Gentiles, simply on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ, are given salvation. The second option is that we are eligible for salvation only as you become Jewish, as you adhere to the law. The, the, this is, each of the positions have their supporters. It seems kind of funny from our perspective because we're not steeped in Judaism. We're not steeped in circumcision. It isn't one of the things that, that I know how to do. You know, Jewish rabbis know how to circumcise kids. I don't know how to do it. Don't want to learn. Not really a necessary part of salvation. But in Judaism, it was a really significant thing. And it doesn't seem that important to us when he's talking, well, really, you have to be circumcised before you're Saved? Well, actually, there were quite a few believers. Interestingly, they were people who were, who were hard after God. They were zealous for God. They were some, some of them were known as Pharisees. The Pharisees, as much as we say bad things about them, they were people who, who simply wanted to be righteous. They wanted to do what God wanted them to do. They were zealous believers. And now along comes these, these Gentiles who haven't been, haven't been brought up in the traditions of Moses, haven't been brought up in the customs and the, and the law, and they say, you know what? Circumcision has always been a significant part of what it means to be part of the people of God. And if we're going to have the Gentiles come and be part of the people of God, then they ought to be circumcised also. So you have this, these contrasting positions, both of which had support. And, and, and if you wanted to, you could actually, if you were a decent debater, make an argument for why circumcision ought to be a part of what it meant to be a believer, especially in the first century. But as the church discussed it, as they began to look at, at, at the history and what happened in Judaism, they came up with a resolution. And the resolution is very straightforward. Faith is the only requirement for salvation. But faith should result in a transformed life. What the early church understood is that there is only one plan of salvation. There is one plan of salvation for the Jews and for the Gentiles, for the good people and for the bad people, for the men and for the women. There's one plan of salvation. You see, the Bible says that we have a universal problem, and that is sin. And fortunately, there's a universal solution, and that is Jesus Christ and his blood. Universal solution is not that we be circumcised and then come to faith in Christ. But they say it very clearly in verse 11. It is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. That's, gonna, that's the resolution, that we are saved by grace. And they say this, we will not place a yoke upon others that we ourselves cannot bear. In that first council, they had this understanding. God had laid out the plan of salvation from the, from the earliest of time. And in laying out that plan of salvation, he gave us the law and he gave us Moses in order to teach us of our un inability to do that which is pleasing to God. We cannot make ourselves righteous. And what the law served to do is it served the purpose of showing us the need for Christ. And so they put forth this doctrinal statement in verse 11, that it is through grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved just as they are. But then they end their counsel with a, with a practical application, a statement found in verse 20. They've dealt with how we are saved. Now they're going to deal with how we should live as a result of, saved, of being saved. And so they give four admonitions found in verses 20 and following. And these admonitions are not requirements to be saved, but rather evidence of a transformed life and a decision that they ask the Gentile believers to embrace, a decision not to be offensive to their Jewish Christians. They spoke directly to, the, to issues which the believers of the first century faced. Honestly, when we look at the four admonitions in verse 20, we think, well, that doesn't really make any difference to me. I mean, they say, avoid food sacrificed to idols. When was the last time you even knew whether any food you were eating was sacrificed to idols? Anybody, any, anybody been to a Chinese restaurant recently? That's the one possibility, by the way. Um, if you go into most Chinese restaurants, they, there is an altar in a Chinese restaurant, and there's usually a, a, a food sacrifice that's been made to that altar. You know, it's a kind of an interesting thing. You know, I, I like Chinese food. I don't like going to Chinese restaurants. Yeah, it just, to me, I mean, there it is. Take a look. Have you, how many of you seen that? Paid attention to it? 
They're burning incense. They're offering food sacrifices to an idol. Yeah, when you go there, maybe you ought to pray for the people who are making those sacrifices. We think this is something that doesn't touch us today. It only doesn't touch us because we choose to be blind to it. But most of us, we go to McDonald's, pretty sure that hasn't been sacrificed to idols. We go to wherever you go, pretty sure that's just normal food. We don't think much about it. It doesn't touch us, but it touched the first century. Because much of the food that they had was sacrificed to idols, and there was an, a, a, an implication of affirmation of that sacrifice by eating the food that was sacrificed to idols. They were called upon to avoid sexual immorality, the second of the four admonitions. Now, we don't have the same type of issues that they have. We have plenty of sexual immorality, but in their time, many of the temples were essentially on religious prostitution. You went and you, had, you, you visited a prostitute in order to appease the God. That was some guy that thought that up, I'm sure. You know, and the Gentiles were coming out of this culture which elevated sexual immorality. And so the call to put aside sexual immorality was a call to a transformed life to say that we will live differently from those around us. The call to avoid blood and, and the meat of strangled animals was almost certainly a call specifically geared towards being respectful of their Jewish brothers. Because those were issues which were significant for the Jewish brothers and part of their long-term tradition. And there was a transition happening in the church from being a, a predominantly Jewish to becoming predominantly Gentile. And what, the, what they were saying in Acts chapter 15 is, we want to make sure that as we expand into the world, we don't embrace practices which are going to be offensive to one another. So the rationale, the reason I know this is the rationale for these four requirements is actually given to us in Acts chapter 15. It's not like they, they say, okay, you're saved by grace, but you have to do these things. He says, we are saved by grace alone, just as they are. So both Jews and Gentiles are saved by grace alone. Now, because the law is read every Sabbath, in the synagogue, because in every church to this point, which has been begun, has started in the synagogue, we are going to have an understanding. We are going to ask the Gentiles to have an understanding that we do these things in order to show that we have a transformed life and to not bring offense to fellow believers. Don't act in such a way that we alienate one another and hinder the growth of the church. By the way, this is a side note on... If you're, if you're into biblical history, it is quite likely that when Paul wrote the church at Galatia, the, the book of Galatians, he wrote it right about the time of the Jerusalem Council. So as you're reading that, you can, you can see back and forth. In Galatians, you see that the, the issues, he's debating the issue at the same time in the book of Galatians. And, and there he says, let's not put an obstacle for another person's faith. So we do this, and, I, and, I, and we see this council, and... I think there's a very fair question that comes up as a result of that. It's YBSW. Yeah, but so what? I mean, it was 2,000 years ago. Other than the fact that we know it's inspired Word of God and we ought to read it just because it's the Word of God, what difference does it make? What do we take home from this? And there's two things I suggest you take home from it. The first is this. Do not put upon others something... Okay, put it up so I, don't, so I don't, can read it. Hit me a slide. Do not require more than the Scripture requires of ourselves or of others. See, that's what was happening with the, with the Pharisaical people in the first century. They said, you know what? You've got to be circumcised. You've got to obey the law. You've got to do this. You've got to become like us in order to be part of the family of God. The problem with that is exactly what they said in that council. They couldn't do it. What they were suggesting is they place upon the backs of the Gentiles the very thing which they themselves failed at. Now, here's a good idea. If you can't do something, require somebody else to do it. That might work if you're the boss, but you're not God. The Scripture lays out clearly we're saved by grace. And we have had historically a problem because we have, as, as we have invited people to church, we have told, we, we've tried to imply, tell them, you know, 
Make sure you wear your Sunday best. Make sure you get cleaned up. You want to become a, a Christian? Well, the first thing you need to do is you need to quit smoking. You need to stop drinking. I went to a college, actually, where I had to sign an oath that said I would not dance, I would not smoke, and I wouldn't drink alcoholic beverages. None of those things are written in Scripture. The, the Scripture gives us freedom to do the things which are destructive to our bodies. Not that dancing is necessarily destructive to my body, but break dancing is. I, <laughs> I break some if I try to break dance. You know, but we, we have had this idea that people have to become like us in order to become Christ-like. They have to become like us in order to become part of the kingdom of God. God says he loves everyone, even the people that we don't like, that aren't like us, that have wild hair or no hair, that have big sins or little sins. He loves them all, and all of them are saved by the same measure, that is, by faith in Jesus Christ. And the problem is when we impose upon others things which aren't in Scripture, we also impose things upon ourselves, and we can't live up to them. All of us have gone astray. All of us have sinned. And we cannot have a standard which is high enough to reach perfection. It only comes through Jesus Christ. So the first thing, the first yeah, but so what, is this. Don't require more than Scripture requires of ourselves or of others. And the second one is that we ought to experience transformation when we know Jesus. See, the first one is, it comes out of the first point of the Jerusalem Council. We're all saved by grace. We're all saved by grace. We're not saved because we're wearing the right clothes, because we haven't gotten tattoos, or we don't smoke, we don't drink, we don't dance, we don't whatever. We're saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. The second one comes out of the second point in the Jerusalem Council. Let us experience transformation. As we come to Christ, we have a transformation. Our life changes. It ought to change. But we look at ourselves first. We don't look at others and say, you know, you came to Christ, so therefore you have to, you can't drink coffee. I don't drink coffee, you know that? You probably knew I don't drink coffee. Um, I don't like the smell of coffee. I don't like it. You know, people like it. You know, that, that weird commercial where they open that Folgers can, that is like the worst smell in the world to me. It's like, it's like is there a dirty diaper in here or something? Some people love that. I, I, can't I can't figure, figure you know what? You don't, you don't have, have to stop, stop drinking coffee to come to Christ. And I don't have to stop drinking Mountain Dew to come to Christ. If we put things upon others that aren't in Scripture, we do people a disservice. Now, here's the thing. If you know I don't like coffee, don't serve it to me. Why would you serve it? You know, why would you serve me something you know I don't like? That's just human nature, right? But in the church, it takes on a far greater significance. If you know that somebody has a problem with eating meat sacrificed to idols, why would you do it in front of them? Even if it's perfectly fine with you and it doesn't touch your conscience at all. What the first council said is, respect one another. Don't create conflict within the church of Jesus Christ by abusing your freedom and showing off your freedom in front of others who don't feel free. So if you know there's somebody that has a difficulty with Christians that smoke, don't smoke in front of them. You know, smoke wherever you want to smoke. It's not a, that's not an issue of sin. And if you know there's a Christian that's difficulty with you committing adultery, don't commit adultery no matter where you are, because that's a biblical mandate. But where there's freedom, exercise your freedom, but not to the hurt of those around you. That's what the council says. We're all saved by grace. We all have one way to heaven. We all have great freedom. But we live together in unity and harmony, and the church grows when we choose to be transformed into Christ's likeness. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the grace of Jesus Christ, which allowed a wretch like me to be a part of the people of God. 
Not because I obeyed some rule that was imposed upon me by somebody who thought they knew better than Scripture, but because you loved me and you offered me salvation. I ask that you would help us together to embrace the doctrine of grace and to be transformed by the power of the Spirit, that we would be a people who help others embrace grace. Amen.